Today we have the opportunity to interview Dr. Roy Baumeister. Roy Baumeister is one of the most successful researchers in social psychology and an extremely prolific writer. He has published well over 500 papers and more than 30 books. Some of them, including his recent book on willpower, have been named best-selling books by the New York Times. Uh, he has extremely high academic credentials. He has been cited over 90,000 times. Dr. Baumeister got his Bachelor in Psychology from Princeton University, then earned his Master's from Duke University and went back to Princeton where he did his PhD under advisorship of uh, well-known Evan Jones. Dr. Baumeister works on self-depletion, on self-esteem, on aggression, on sexuality and a lot on the need for humans to belong and what happens if they are rejected by other people or the groups. And we are looking forward to what Dr. Baumeister will tell us about his personal leadership style and his experience with leadership in the academic world. Dr. Baumeister, thank you very much for supporting our center and for uh, willing to do this interview with us. First question, slightly provocative. Uh, when you are so accomplished, when you have achieved almost everything that a psychologist can achieve in, in their lifetime, hundreds of publications, best-selling books, uh, fellowship status with important associations, do you need leadership? Do you still need someone who tells you what to do, how to do, etc.? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I think the interesting thing of being a professor is uh, we don't really get much leadership. We don't have a boss. It's hard, I think, even for professors to understand what work is like for most people. I understand surveys say that uh, almost half of people who work in the world say the worst thing about their job is their boss. But. Uh, you know, we, we have a department chair, but that person doesn't really have that much power, and uh, uh, we don't have all that much power either. So leadership is, is somewhat absent uh, from the life we live as a professor. Um, so I don't feel I need anyone to tell me uh, at this point what to do or which, which direction to go. Uh, but that's sort of been the, 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 the situation my entire career. Uh, it's nice early uh, in to have advisors who uh, help you understand how the system works and uh, how to do your work. Uh, but even there, you know, the, it's not leadership in the sense of, of someone having power to tell you what to do. Uh, they're more giving advice and uh, helping you become, become who you want to be. Mm -hmm. Was that different before you came, became a professor? So you, you are a professor for three decades now, but before that you had postdoc status, you, you were a grad mm -hmm. student at Princeton and, and certainly some people could tell you a little more what you needed to help with, like in teaching, you probably were supposed to uh, have the group in some teaching responsibilities or so, and, and there you had a leader in a formal sense, but also an advisor uh, for your PhD. I certainly had an advisor for the PhD, um, uh, I, again, I did not feel he was telling me what to do uh, very often. You, maybe at first he uh, set up a project for me and said, here, here, here do this. That was uh, uh, Jones. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, great Edward B. Jones. Yeah. Um, but uh, pretty soon he let me develop my own ideas and he offered suggestions and comments and uh, uh, helped me do the work and make it better and, and write it and publish it. Uh, but again, it was not a leader in the sense of uh, you know, a political leader or uh, even in an organization, someone who makes decisions for the groups and gives commands. Mm -hmm. When you think of uh, Florida State University's top management, uh, vice chancellor or yes. university's president, uh, uh, and compare that to Western Reserve University where you've been for 20 years, um, or other institutions that you visited, uh, what do you think is good leadership in academia in that area? Well, that's an interesting uh, th thing to bring up. You know, we have the impression that the university president is off somewhere raising money or doing something and has no relevance to our daily lives. And yet I've seen, as different ones come and go, it does really get better or worse uh, for the institution as a whole and for the uh, 
uh, for the faculty. Um, good leaders, uh, there have had some at both institutions who uh, helped the institution to grow, who uh, have found ways to solve the money problems and, and rewarded excellence and cultivated the top people, uh, you know, looked for ways to enable uh, creative, productive people to do better. Uh, and others uh, seemed concerned just with uh, saving money. Um, they're more indifferent to, uh, to excellence and to thriving. And certainly my life I've devoted very much to the pursuit of excellence. And so uh, I, I sense the difference uh, very acutely. You know, sometimes at the same institution, it has been much more or much less possible uh, to, to carry out that sort of thing, to, to uh, um, get students and do research and to uh, try new teaching things. Uh, so um, the uh, effect of the leadership to the extent uh, you know, I felt it was uh, in, in supporting and cultivating and, and, and encouraging the, the, the pursuit of excellence uh, by individuals. Is it more the individuals like the university's president or, or other people in the senior management team or is it like um, external conditions? Say when the financial crisis kicked in and we all read the stories about Harvard's uh, endowment going down a third and that Harvard had to cut uh, prestigious programs etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, do, do individuals have much of an influence there or is it more this environment? Uh, certainly the environment makes a big difference uh, uh, in the face of the worldwide financial crisis or something uh, there, there's a lot less than that a, a leader or administrator can do uh, still I, I sense the difference uh, across those times when we had a change in leadership uh, the, uh, the the quality of the work for individuals changed for for better or for worse um, there were years at my current institution where there was essentially no recognition of quality work and uh, they would either give no raise or they would give the same salary raise to everyone mm. uh, regardless of what, what quality and, and you know, that, that surprises me I, I think uh, um, if there's only an, if you can't give raises based on merit um, then um, you're making the top productive people bear all the uh, the burden of uh, of the uh, of the financial problems. Uh, instead, you should take away the cost of living, and then everyone bears the uh, the suffering equally. Uh, but you still want to reward and encourage the uh, the most productive people because that goes to the health of the organization. You know what happens when an institution stops rewarding excellence is that that the top people leave because they have opportunities uh, in a university in particular where there's tenure. Some people, as we know, are just not very productive or not very useful, and they can stay there for life. Mm. Um, no matter what happens to the salary or anything, they're not going anywhere because nobody else wants them. Mm. Uh, so you can do long-term damage in a short time uh, to an institution like a university. Now, corporation or, or political structures, they're somewhat different because there is more, more turnover. But uh, again, mm. in some countries, it's very hard to... Uh, to fire a worker who is not, not successful, not productive. Uh, so then you have to operate within the rules uh, that, that exist. Okay, so in, in the university when bad and good leadership uh, uh, has an impact on people, how come that some of these top managers or administrators are good at it and others are less good at it? Do you think it's, it's again, individual differences that people bring with them or can you learn to be a good university administrator or president and do some people just learn it better by attending executive courses or whatever? Uh, well, uh, you gave me a, is it this or that, but I, I certainly think it's both, mm -hmm. that some people are definitely better leaders than others. Uh, much of that is probably because of what they learned. Uh, I don't know that people are born uh, with uh, the ability to, to lead, certainly you're not born with the ability to run a great university or a large corporation or, uh, or, or a state. Um, so uh, yes, there are differences in temperament and uh, what people want in a leader is not always what's, what's most important uh, for leadership. Uh, I remember uh, data showing that most 
elections to be president of the United States are won by the candidate who is taller. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, well, you can say it's good to be tall to be a leader, but I don't think that makes you any better uh, a leader in terms of making the right decisions or s having the values or policies uh, that will do it. Uh, in the same ways, people want people who are very confident and optimistic. I think that's reassuring and that's what they will go to for a leader. Uh, but uh, again, uh, that, there's no guarantee that that's the, uh, that actually makes the best leader. Uh, especially if the person's unrealistically confident and optimistic. Mm. Have you ever attended a leadership course or a training course for being a good PhD advisor or anything similar? No, no, mm. I've not had, had the opportunity. And how would you describe your personal style in say guiding others like your graduate students in the first year they certainly ask for advice and and consider maybe they consider you more a leader as you would consider or label yourself a leader how do you personally deal with them hmm. um well i mean i think of a leader as someone who is in charge of a group mm -hmm. and i i've never seen my own role that way i, I have a number of students but i think of each one as an individual and I have an individual relationship to that person. So I, I don't have to formulate a vision for this is what I want the group to accomplish this year. Um, instead I see myself as connected to a, a group of individual students and sometimes I wish they would, <laughs> they would do this but I don't have, have any power or, in, or seek any power to uh, uh, try to make them do what I, what I want them to do. I, I tell them if I think they are wasting their time or doing something stupid, uh, but uh, it, it's ultimately their uh, their decision. I mean, my, my my philosophy with which I approach these things is I and, and I say this is a very sort of selfish hedonistic thing is I want everyone who's connected with me to be to be better off because of that connection. So each each person and each institution. Um, if I can make sure that, that they benefit from it, um, well, then I think you have a very nice life because people like to keep you around and uh, you can do good and it's, it's, it's very satisfying. Again, I'm saying this as a, as a sort of a rational, self-serving strategy. Um, so with each student, you know, we'll have different uh, strengths and weaknesses and so on. And I see my job as trying to help build on the strengths and remedy the uh, weaknesses. Uh, it's important to give both positive and negative feedback because that's the best learning from most information. Uh, my advisor, Edward E. Jones, uh, I think his philosophy of education was if, 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 if you gave criticism to a student uh, and it was very thorough and thoughtful and uh, intelligent and, and, and did I say thorough? Uh, then you could dispense with uh, anything positive. I, I think I could count on one hand the, the positive things he said to me in, in, in four years. Uh, although I, I think I remember each of them because it was such a surprise. Um, but later when I worked with someone who also gave positive, I said, oh, I can learn a lot faster if he also tells me what's good as, as well as what's not so good. And so when I give advice uh, to uh, PhD students, uh, advisees, and so on. Uh, I try to be very clear with both that uh, uh, I say, well, this passage doesn't make sense, and this passage doesn't make sense, but this one makes sense. So, you know, then they can see, okay, this one I did it right, and this one I did it wrong. If you just say no, 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 then that's very discouraging, even if it's, uh, uh, even if you're, you're correct. And, and, and uh, um, in terms of uh, guiding people to do, I, I Guys, because they bring me ideas, and uh, I try to say, well, this could work, and if it worked, it would be important, or if it worked, it's still not that interesting. Uh, yeah, I sort of look at, you know, they have a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I can look at them from the perspective of the journals and the editors, and I use my experience to say, well, if you say this, they're going to say this, this, and this, so you need to be prepared to, to, to come with those. Um, and uh, 
you know, a leader should also sort of convey some uh, sort of positive vision. Uh, so I try to get across what I like about this career and what's 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 good about it, mm -hmm. uh, so that you know, people can see that the effort and the sacrifice are, are worth it because it's a uh, it's a very uh, mostly it's a very pleasant and satisfying job mm -hmm. if if you are suited for it if mm -hmm. you have the ability uh, and uh, you're able to work on your own and, and be independent. Uh, I know some advisors will give their students deadlines and you know meet with me every Tuesday morning and bring me three pages. I don't do that. Uh, partly I, I was not taught that way myself, but in my sense is you go from that then to be an assistant professor where nobody tells you anything. It's very poor preparation. So uh, what I'm trying to do is make people able to finish their PhD, get a job, and be successful at the next level. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, they're on their own. I can't help them with that. But uh, uh, So they have to be able to manage their own time, to make some of their own decisions. Yeah, I say, you come in early, come talk to me every week, and we'll go through your ideas. But by the end, you should be running your own program, and I will be a consultant, and I ideally recede into the background. and. Then when you get your PhD, go off into the world, you're fully able to uh, operate your own situation. Mm -hmm. I, I try to relate that to my own experiences as, as a PhD supervisor or head of the little social psych group I'm, I'm leading and, and I'm continuously experiencing one problem and I think that probably relates to what we, you were just saying that you don't consider your PhD students mainly as a group but as individuals working on their individual mm -hmm. topics or PhDs mm -hmm. and, and also yesterday in your talk you mentioned that you try to keep research programs separate so you yeah. have one program <laughs> on depletion and you have another program on rejection and you, you typically don't mingle with them and, um, well, actually, they, they do tend to overlap or give ideas to other things. It, it is one of the nice benefits of working in different areas is sometimes things carry over from one to the other, but uh, at least in my mind, I wanted to have a couple separate lines of work, and, uh, uh, but that was more of a joke that I, I, I tried to keep them separate. Yeah, but the reality is that at least yeah. I experience it that way that I do not. I do know much more of what my individual students and postdocs do than they know from each other because mm -hmm. we have like the broad picture and they yes. work on the individual project. Couldn't or shouldn't we do more to integrate them and really see them as part of a team or a group and have like meetings where we get this vision across so would, might it not be m even more positive? I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I mean, from time to time we have a meeting where we all go together and everyone goes around and says what he or she is doing. Uh, and they often say they, they like that, they find out what others uh, is happening. Um, in terms of getting the big picture, um, again, I, I'm not sure there's a big picture that's unique to my laboratory. I want them to have the big picture for the, the scientific problem they're working on, so that might include what another graduate student in our program does, but it might include what 10 people on the other side of the world are doing. Uh, so I think we, we encourage them to uh, you know, read, read the research literature and keep up with what's happening. And, and we do then have graduate seminars where we can discuss topics and things too. But uh, um, uh, anyway, to try to get them into more of a, a, of a team uh, I don't know that that really uh, pays off. It, it might, uh, in, in, in the kind of operation I have where different people have different interests and I, I want them to develop each what they're doing. Yes, if someone else is already doing something relevant, then I say, oh, we should yeah. go talk to George because he's, he's got data uh, on this. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they learn from each other too in terms of methods and procedures, even dealing with the, the, the bureaucracy. Um, but uh, um, I don't foster a sense that, uh, that, that we're all a team that have to be working towards some common goal, which would presumably to, you know, the, would fit into my master plan because 
I don't have a master plan for uh, <laughs> where all the research should go. My, my plan is I want the people to be successful. Do you, in, in German we would say, do, are you on first name terms with your students? Do you, do you also do activities with them a, apart from, from lab work or do you know about each of them personal relationships or well, I know I know some I mean I have them over to my house from time to time and we sit out by the pool and drink some wine and talk about uh, ideas and things like that and um, the uh, the postdoctoral fellows it's it's easier to be friends with than the uh, the, the PhD students because Uh, I've seen many programs go through this. Uh, they'll start with young faculty and they say, well, we just all want to be friends, we're working together. But then the faculty member has to make the student rewrite something and the student says, well, I thought we were friends, you're criticizing <laughs> me, you're making me do this again. Um, so it's a bit of a tension between trying to be two friends. With a, with a postdoc, I don't have to make him do anything mm. uh, because They're, they're finished, you know, they understand this is their chance to, to, to build uh, their research uh, portfolio uh, and, and get to a career. So uh, I think postdocs generally understand uh, uh, that uh, it's in their, their best interest to do the best they can. Uh, they don't need uh, an advisor to tell them to write this over or something like that. Uh, with the graduate students, you know, with a thesis or something like that. Uh, there are requirements that you know, we have a responsibility to the university to make sure the students' work reaches a certain level of quality. Uh, that's not true with a postdoc. So I've been, I had more lasting friendships, I think, with the postdoctoral fellows than with the graduate students. Um, that's, I think, just how the, they're built into the system. And I think in, in the U.S. in particular, where PhD students first are students and, and, and not like in Germany employed as lecturers or right so yes yeah. um, you already mentioned your advisor Jones and, and, and you said that you were inspired by him or you you, you, you took him as, as a role model in some ways <coughs> but you also used other ways of for example, providing feedback from other people you have met. And uh, do you think these were deliberate decisions? Did, did you ever think, oh, I will never do it that way, or this was good, I, I will try to do it myself? Oh, yes, I thought very carefully about how, how to do things. I looked at the, how different people treated me and treated others and tried to learn from them. Um, when I was in graduate school, Almost all the uh, faculty I knew had all advisees of the same gender. Mm -hmm. uh, they were mostly men. Mm -hmm. Some worked with all male students, some worked with all female students. <laughs> I knew I always wanted to work with both. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to say, why is that? Uh, and, and, you know, I looked for differences in styles and uh, I tried to think about how I could adjust my behavior so that I could be most effective with, uh, with both males and females. So for me, it's been a very um, thoughtful process uh, of uh, analyzing what sorts of things worked. Like I said, uh, with criticism or praise, some people praise and praise and praise, and it feels good, but it doesn't really have much informational activity. Uh, so, as I said, when Joan said something positive, it was so rare that, uh, oh my goodness, uh, it, it had high impact. But maybe that wasn't enough, there wasn't enough uh, information. So I, I again looked for a balance and I, I realized just in terms of information, um, the learning is best if you're very clear and explicit with both, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what you're doing right. You know, even in a single paper or in terms of how your how the whole past year has gone. Uh, so it's important to give people evaluations uh, and to, uh, to be quite explicit. And I've had other faculty who, who believe in only praising students and say, oh, you can't give the student this much criticism, they'll be all upset. But of course, if you cannot take criticism, you cannot be a researcher. <laughs> you know, what other field do you, 
you produce some work that you worked on and then you send it off and you get back 12 pages of single space comments telling you <laughs> everything that's wrong with you. If you can't handle that, uh, you're not going to be, be successful. So um, I cultivate the attitude that uh, you know, this is not personal, this doesn't mean you're a bad person. Uh, it's just you've got to improve in all these things. And, uh, and again, if you also say, well, these parts are good, and so you know, do more like this and less like this, that helps you start to figure out how to do it. I remember when I was a, a young professor trying to figure out how to publish, and I feel like I was, you know, in a dark room, feeling against the wall. How can I get through? I, I knew the experiments were good, but I couldn't write them well. And, uh, it's just so difficult to figure out what's right. But you know, the feedback that this part is right and this part is not. Like, oh, okay. Um, so I tried to provide that sort of thing. Okay. I'm coming, getting to my last question, and that's about values. And I think in the recent past, we've seen so many scandals, particularly in our discipline, social psychology, data fraud, plagiarism, and these things are also happening in, in many other disciplines, but for you and me, it should feel particularly yes. bad. So how do you make sure in your interactions with students, graduate students, postdocs, that, that these things don't happen? What well, what is your personal view on Well, there's the something I think it's useful to bring up periodically uh, and to point out these scandals and, and discuss them in a group meeting or something like that so that people understand how much damage they do to themselves and to everyone else uh, by these things. I mean, the, the case of, of Diedrich Stoppel, who was, you know, who faked uh, data for years and so on. Uh, it wasn't just that... Uh, He's now ruined his own life as a researcher. His, his career is, is, is over. And, uh, um, but many people who worked with him, there were people who had several publications with him that they were using to get a job or to, to get tenure, uh, and suddenly those are taken away. Mm. And um, that's uh, something you were counting on to, to help you. So he, you know, he seriously damaged other people's lives too. So I want people to understand the, the gravity uh, of, of scientific misconduct. It's not only a betrayal of the field or a, a selfish act, it's, it's, it's something that's really destructive uh, to others. And of course I, I point out too that uh, uh, once you have done some good work and, and, and published it, then you would never want to do anything wrong. I mean, if I were to fake data now, uh, all of those hundreds of publications and all those, all those other people who worked with me all that would be put into uh, uh, into question, and, and it would lose its credibility. And the, the costs uh, for faking the data, uh, at my point, and you know, even people much younger than I am, uh, far outweigh uh, the benefits and the risks. Um, it's only perhaps when you're starting out, I think, that you might get the temptation that well, I could just make up something or distort something, and that would help me get published and get a job, and it won't hurt anyone. But, uh, but, but very soon you don't want to take any chance and, and now that they're able to catch uh, fraud retroactively uh, if, you, if you fake something even starting in your career uh, and then become honest and do good work there's still a good chance that someone will go back and find that and then everything you do since then is, is ruined and your, your, your career will be uh, essentially over uh, so it's important to make people aware of the costs. It's, it's aware to just, just how, how wrong uh, something like that is. It's a betrayal of the, the sacred trust we have as, as scientists. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome.